What is a turret? It's an interesting question, because depending on when you ask or who you ask, the answer is going to change quite a bit. After all, maybe you're asking about a tank turret. Maybe you're asking about a battleship turret like Iowa or Bismarck. Maybe you're that one person asking about ball turrets on aircraft, which are really an entirely different thing and on their own. It really depends on who you're asking and when you're asking. For example, if you're asking about ship turrets, if you asked in 1890, you're going to get a completely different answer than if you asked in 1990. As such, I'm going to do a short overview of the history of ship-based gun turrets. Because it's an interesting topic where things really do change quite a lot depending on when you ask or what type of ship you're asking about. First off, a disclaimer though. This video is focused entirely on the history of gun turrets. This is not going to go into the often very complex engineering involved. An engineer, I am most certainly not. Any engineering talk is going to be simple and entirely in the context of differentiating between different kinds of turrets. With that out of the way, what were the earliest turrets aboard ships? Well, the most famous answer is always going to be USS Monitor and her turret. Her famous battle with CSS Virginia is, after all, where turrets first came into the popular imagination. This is not inaccurate, insofar as Monitor is the first combat warship to go into combat with a turret. However, at the same time, the British were putting their own designs into the experimental stage. They even managed to beat Monitor by a few months by placing an experimental Coles turret aboard the HMS Trusty in 1861. Cowper Coles, by the way, is arguably the father of the gun turret, at least in the Royal Navy, having come up with the concept during the Crimean War and put it into practice in the early 1860s. Trusty, though, was a very experimental design. Trusty was an ironclad battery, which was basically a big armored box stuffed with guns for bombardment duty more than any proper warship. Sticking an experimental turret on her certainly didn't make her a seagoing warship. So, if you're asking about who had the first turret, well, technically the British, though the Americans beat them to getting it into combat. I'm hardly going to argue that Monitor was a properly seagoing warship, though, because she certainly wasn't. At any rate, the Coles turret and Ericsson's turret aboard Monitor were pretty much contemporary with one another, even if they were developed completely independently of each other. From an engineering standpoint, I'm given to understand that Coles had the technologically superior model, though I make no claims to being an engineer who can verify that. Regardless of which is superior, both of these early turrets would mostly see use aboard coastal warships. In America, Ericsson's turret was used on many a different monitor in many a different configuration. It would not see use on anything larger than a monitor, however. Later monitors, the larger ones of Spanish-American War Vintage, would use different kinds of turrets. Similar looking, but different kinds on the inside. As for the Coles turret, it would primarily see use aboard coastal defense warships. Not monitors, but also ships intended for defense, more so than sailing to India or other things like that. All of these were experimental to some level or another. HMS Royal Sovereign, for example, was a ship of the line cut down and fitted with four turrets, creating an understandably unstable design. HMS Prince Albert, the first British warship that is a proper warship to carry turrets, was also experimental and still just for coastal defense. Even the first ocean-going one of the bunch, HMS Monarch, was arguably inefficient in that she could not fire directly fore or aft. And the less said about HMS Captain, the better. Now, the main similarity between these two early turret designs from different sides of the Atlantic is that they aren't what would traditionally be called a turret in modern parlance. They had circular, rotating turrets mounted atop the hull. Seems similar, certainly, but the key difference here is they lacked anything rotating beneath them. In either Monitor or Prince Albert, the turrets rested atop the hull and rotated on their own. They lacked what is known as a barbette. This is an armored section beneath a turret or gun house that protects a rotating mount that contains the powder, shells, hoist, and all that fun stuff. In early turrets, all of that is absent and just a circular mount rotated. This is where language development starts getting fun and engaging. Before that, though, along with the turret ships, there were also barbette ships. 
If turret ships are a big self-contained gun house, then barbette ships were open mounts atop armored section. The barbette, armoring the rotating section beneath the guns, would provide protection for the bits mentioned before. But the guns themselves were often exposed or only partially armored. This was admittedly lighter and allowed for mounting higher in the hull and a consequent increase in stability on ships using such a design. In general, though, they were seeing service alongside turret ships as navies tried to work out which one was better. In the end, this argument would largely end upon the construction of the Majestic-class battleships, and for that matter, HMS Renown. This is where we jump back to language development. These ships, and other ships and navies that followed suit, mounted fully armored gunhouses over the barbette. These gunhouses would have several different names. You could see fully enclosed barbette, or armored gunhouse, or maybe armored barbette, or fully armored barbette, or any other number of names. It varied depending on who you asked, but they're all describing the same thing. Which is why, eventually, the name turret became the common answer on what to call these mountings. Barbette remained in use as well, for the circular mounting beneath the turrets, which themselves were more squared than the original circular ones. This can, of course, become confusing. A turret is the circular gun house, completely self-contained and without a barbette. A turret is also the fully enclosed and armored gun house mounted atop a barbette and the rotating mount it protected. Both are turrets, yet both are completely different designs. This is why language development is fun, especially if you study history like this. As the history of turrets becomes more standardized past this point, though, the old-style mounts go out of favor, and you only see the barbette mounts remain. Everyone shifted to those because they were lighter while still being heavily armored. This doesn't mean the experimental design stopped, though. There were such fun things as the American Navy deciding the best way to make up for the slow firing rate of their larger caliber guns was to mount a second turret atop the main guns with faster firing 8-inch guns. This was also done with the intention of weight savings, as an increased tertiary battery forced the secondary 8-inch guns towards the ends of the ship anyway. But it did limit the secondary battery to aiming where the main guns were, while also being somewhat uncomfortable for those forced to serve on them. Imagine serving in the main gun turret, with the 8-inch one blasting away above your head, and that's not even getting into the issues with explosion risks. As one could imagine, that experiment was dropped pretty quickly, as most navies would settle on a standard turret design. Though it isn't to say that it completely went away. While the Americans are the only one to come to mind as actually building ships with stacked turrets like this, the Italians had some wacky designs of their own. I'll put one on screen here, which is alternately described as a quintuple or quadruple turret battleship. I think the way it looks has everything, personally. It was never built, though, which is, honestly, probably for the better, I would not want to be serving in one of those turrets. That Italian detour aside, though, the standard for turrets would quickly become two main guns in a rotating turret and barbette mount. This would be standard all across the world for quite some time, until the Italians would make a triple mount for their first dreadnought. Whereupon the Austro-Hungarian Navy did the same, with one of their Tegatovs technically finishing first. And the Russians came to the exact same concept, albeit independently, with their Gongu. Though I should note here, there is technically a distinction between a triple and three-gun turret. You're almost always going to see triple used, but that's for when all three guns are mounted together and elevate together. A three-gun mount is something like what the Iowa has, where every gun can elevate individually. But 99% of the time, it's just going to be called triple for shorthand. These triple mounts, or three guns depending, had the advantage of concentrating firepower and allowing for more guns on the same length of ship. The downside, such as it was, was that these guns required a wider barbette, and by extension, a wider ship. Barring some large sacrifices, if one wanted to put three guns into a barbette really meant for a twin turret. The Italians, in particular, had really big issues with sticking three guns too close together. Outside of Italy, though, 
Europeans didn't really like triple turrets a lot of the time. It was more common on cruisers than on battleships. The British would use them on their interwar light cruiser designs, as well as some wartime designs from World War II, and the Germans would do the same, as well as aboard their Panzerschiff. On battleships in those two navies, though, it would only see use on two designs built post-World War I, the Nelson and the Scharnhorst. And in the latter case, that was as much because the Germans were trying to get as many guns on their ship, more than them actually liking triple turrets. You can see this because they immediately went back to twin mounts on Bismarck. The argument here often came down to concentrate firepower and risk losing more guns, or spread the guns out in more turrets with fewer guns to avoid the risk of losing as many if one of them gets taken out. The Germans were fond of the latter option, and the British, well, they actually wanted to use triple turrets on the Lion class, as well as things like the N3 and G3, it just happened to turn out that they never actually finished any of these ships, so they only ever got triple turrets on Nelson. For the other navies that did triple turrets, the Austrians lost their coastline, the Russians and Soviets would never finish any battleship after World War I, and while they didn't do triple turrets, the French kind of just skipped right over them and jumped to the next logical development in line. But we'll get back to that one later. Because across the Atlantic, the USN was extremely fond of triple turrets, indeed. After Nevada, every single standard type battleship had triple turrets until Colorado. And even Colorado only had twin turrets because that was the only way they could fit 16-inch guns on such a relatively small hull. Because you can see, they go immediately back to triple turrets on South Dakota. The Lexingtons are a bit of an odd one, because they had twins entirely because they had to be so long and thin for their speed. As such, and as a general rule, barring compromise designs, the United States Navy always tried to go for triple turrets, be it on battleships or cruisers. Going back to that argument of firepower over theoretical safety, the USN wanted firepower. A ship with three triple mount turrets has nine guns compared to eight on a ship with four twins, which is also going to have to be longer to fit all four of those turrets. Back to the French, though. This is where the next, and final to see completion, evolution in turrets comes in. The quad turret. Basically continuing the same theory of fitting more guns in a smaller space, these mounts would fit four guns as compared to two or three. The design of quads varies between navies, with the French building turrets that had an internal wall between the two pairs of guns as a safety measure. If one side got blown out, the other pair of guns could continue firing. This is not, contrary to popular belief, two twin turrets squished together, though. Nor were their interwar designs the first to do it, since they used quads on both of their never-completed World War I designs. The USN also looked at quads for the early North Carolina designs, when it was armed with 14-inch guns, which is partially why they could actually swap those guns out for triple turrets with 16-inch guns without needing to do major redesigns. The only navy other than the French to actually build quad turrets would be the Royal Navy with the King George V class that had quad 14s and a single twin 14-inch turret to do with weight and stability issues. However, the issue with quads was the potential issue of triple turrets, wider barbettes, taken to the logical next level. Navies generally only looked at them, France aside, when there was a desire to get more firepower out of the least tonnage possible. This is largely why, except in the Normandy class of World War I, you only see quads seriously considered on treaty era battleships and basically never considered for cruisers or the like. Some weird cases like the USN developing a quad version of their auto-loading 8-inch turret aside. That would only really fit on a hull the size of the battleship, though, so... Yeah, still probably wouldn't have been on your average cruiser. And I suppose at the end here, I should make note of the Tillmans, because if I don't, someone will ask. I really wish I could give detailed discussions on these, but the plain fact is, they were never seriously considered for construction. These were, what if we had unlimited money and built the biggest ships we possibly could? Thought experiments that had some basic spring styles drawn up, and not any sort of detailed plans. 
Still, they were the home of such things as sextuple 16-inch turrets. For those keeping track, that is six 16-inch guns in the exact same turret. Friedman notes that the sketches for these guns show them semi-superimposed, but these are just sketches, not anywhere near detailed design drawings, and I question the stability of a turret with six 16-inch guns inside it. I also question the safety of serving in that turret. However, this is where the evolution of proper turrets basically stops. Single turrets are functionally identical, if only smaller, than the ones above. But to round the video off, there is one clarification I would like to make here. While the circular turrets of yesteryear are still called turrets, a similar thing did continue on once they went out of vogue. Destroyers and the secondary weaponry of certain battleships. These look like turrets, with fully enclosed gun houses and all. They are not, however, turrets in the same way as battleship or cruiser would have. They're much more akin to the earlier circular mounts, if much lighter and smaller. Because remember, a modern turret is a mount atop a barbette with rotating structures inside the barbette. Something like the 5-inch guns on an Iowa or a Fletcher or something? Those are more properly called mounts. The gun house rotates, yeah, but everything beneath it is fixed. It is not entirely identical to the old circular turrets, and it is certainly not the same as the proper barbette turrets either. So the technical term is mount. Though most people will be forgiven for just calling them turrets anyway, because not everyone is a pedantic naval historian. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you like the content, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.